March of the Machine, The Aftermath, She Who Breaks the World, written by Grace P. Fong, narrated by Wyatt Fawcett. Nissa Ravane is digging her grave. Under the cover of night, she drives her shovel into Zalfir's ground and wipes sweat from her brow. The task should come easily to her. It's just dirt after all. Once she could bend nature with a whim, but now her heart pounds, her limbs shiver. She concludes she must have overexerted her recovering body and decides that she will take a well-deserved rest upon completing the task. But she cannot ignore the question that claws at her heart. Is this what happens when a planeswalker loses her spark? She asked the others what happened, but they could only describe the battle and her revival. No one could answer what had happened within her soul. Chandra suggested it was a side effect of her revival. Karn theorized it was damaged when the Phyrexians altered Nyssa's mind and body. But Teferi only listened and nodded. It's not just her, he said. Teferi's spark had faded sometime after the invasion. Koth's as well. Chandra is the only one among them who seemed to have kept hers. Well... Chandra and Ajani. The Silex had gone off in the blind eternities. Holes had been punched in the space between planes. Maybe this is some sort of natural response from the multiverse. A great pruning. A taking back of that mysterious energy that once filled them. It doesn't matter the cause, though. No amount of theorizing offers Nyssa comfort. So, to comfort herself, she touches the heavy clod she lifted from the red earth, but the dirt does not reassure her like the familiar soil of her homeworld Zendikar. She squeezes it between her fingers. She asks the plane how it feels, but it does not answer. Perhaps the damage extends beyond her spark, right down to her animist powers. She hears something else, though. Not the deep, reverberating voice of a plane that shakes her very soul, but something distant, lively, and human. Music. The drums of Mirrodin and Zalfir are celebrating their victory over the Phyrexian invaders. Since leaving the austere Juraga clan in her youth, music had become her favorite indulgence. But today it mocks her, does nothing but make her chest ache. She knows somewhere in the firelight her friends are celebrating, too. Just that morning, Karn and Koth had finished roofing the last house in a new village. Nissa saw relief, even happiness, in their eyes as they moved in alongside the Mirren refugees. For they were all united as survivors. They had invited her to join them. Are you sure I'm welcome? she had asked. Of course, Teferi put his hand on her shoulder and said, You will have a new home here if you just try. So Nyssa worked with the other survivors, ate with them, talked with them, but it wasn't the same. Teferi had his country again. Koth and Karn were forging a new one. Nyssa's Zendikar was locked a multiverse away. But Zalfir still never spoke to her. Neither did the five colored suns, more refugees from Mirrodin now at home in Zalfir's sky. She felt cut off, lost in the multiverse with no voice calling her home. Maybe no plane would hear her ever again. They'd all lost their sparks, but only Nyssa still wanted to planeswalk. Even if her friends seemed to be moving on without her, she still cared about their happiness so not wanting to bring down the spirits of their celebration, she excused herself. There's at least one task she can do. She thrusts her shovel into the ground. Again and again. Finally, the hole is deep enough. Next to it, her Phyrexian carapace awaits burial. With the Phyrexian leader dead and her virulent vice grip on the glistening oil severed, the survivors were able to cleanse it with halo but the inert metal remained. The copper skeleton is covered in mangled spikes, and those spikes are covered in the dried blood of her friends. She rubs one. The dark residue flakes off of her fingertips. 
She wonders whose blood it was. Maybe Koth, maybe Ren, maybe Chandra. Chandra. She had hurt Chandra, almost killed her. Nyssa and the other planeswalkers tried to fight the Phyrexian invaders, but they became enemies' weapons. But they became the enemy's weapons. After the Phyrexian defeat, Nyssa's friends said they forgave her. They cut her out of her metal prison and cleansed her mind of the Phyrexian influence. They cleansed the oil from the stem sword, but they could not cleanse the memories of what she had done. The copper rib cage had been both a trap and armor. A construct of crippling terror yet intoxicating power. It granted her the ability to unleash a call through the branches of the invasion tree and speak the glory of Phyrexia to every plane in the multiverse. And right now, Nyssa is disgusted with herself because, despite her friend's sacrifices, despite Chandra's sacrifices, part of her misses hearing those planes. She tries to kick the carapace into the grave she dug, but it is heavy. Heavier than the shovel, heavier than the earth. Someone behind her speaks. You left the party early. I just wanted to make sure you got something to eat. Nyssa would recognize that voice anywhere. She turns to face Chandra Nalar, arm outstretched, offering her a ripe mango. The smile on Chandra's face is warm, and Nyssa knows she does not deserve it. Nyssa shakes her head. I'm not hungry. She watches Chandra's gaze drift to the shovel and then the emptied Phyrexian shell. Need help? I'm fine. Chandra steps forward anyway. She hands the mango to Nyssa and puts her palm against the copper hull. Heat radiates from her fingers and the dirty metal starts to cave under her touch. Her hair ignites into a shock of flame. Nyssa can't help but think she's so beautiful like this. The spikes bend down with heat. The carapace softens into a formless hunk of slag. The smell of cooling metal fills the night air and Nyssa wants to tell Chandra to stop, to let her have this one small success. But instead, she still tells Chandra, thanks. No problem, Chandra winks. With one swift kick, hunts the crumpled skeleton into the hole. Without hesitation, she gestures for Nisha's shovel. The sooner we fill this hole, the sooner you can get back to having fun. Instead, Nissa hands Chandra the uneaten mango. I'll celebrate when I'm done. Chandra drops the mango to grab Nissa's wrist with both hands. Her palms are so warm. Just do it later then. Come on. Nissa knows Chandra's just trying to make her feel better by focusing on their victory, but it's not working. She slides gently out of Chandra's grasp. I'll be quick, promise. But Chandra does not leave. She paces around, using her foot to nudge dirt in the ground when she thinks Nyssa isn't looking. There's something she's not saying. So Nyssa asks, Is there a reason I have to go right now? Chandra gnaws her lips before lowering her head and softly admitting, Because if you're too late, I might not be there. As Chandra's words sink in, Nissa's memory drifts back to the day she awoke in Zalfir. The first thing she felt was Chandra's warm hand gripping her own, and the first thing she saw was Chandra's broad smile. Her limbs were weighed down by dead copper metal, but her thoughts were hers. Chandra's smile was hers. I'm right here, Chandra had said. I'm right here and I'm not going anywhere. Nissa wants to say something to remind Chandra of her own words. But before she can protest, Chandra's voice spills out to fill the quiet that she can't stand. Tomorrow, I'm leaving to find the Johnny. Nyssa opens her mouth to reply, but she doesn't know how to respond to a broken promise. Her reticence only troubles Chandra further. It's only for a bit, only until I find him. I'm one of the few people who can still planeswalk, right? If I can't bring him back, who can? And I know you'll be right here waiting for me. But Nissa does not want to wait here. She doesn't get to choose because she's not a planeswalker. Nissa barely hears herself when she whispers, But you kissed me. You finally kissed me. Chandra shifts from foot to foot. I mean, yeah, 
but I still gotta go. The rest of Chandra's words meant nothing to Nyssa. How could Chandra love so many people so freely, yet leave her so easily? Does she lack more than just a spark? She has to know. Nyssa steals her voice. Then to be clear, exactly what kind of love do you have for me? Nyssa watches anxiety build inside Chandra. Made of words she doesn't know how to say, turning into frantic hand gestures that start, stop, and then start again, as if her fingers could shape her jumbled thoughts into sentences. What comes out is, I... Chandra's hands drop to her sides. Like I knew I had to save you. You're a hero, Chandra, a planeswalker. You'd save anyone. Nyssa thrusts her shovel into the ground. Am I no different than anyone else? No, that's not it. It's... It's hard to explain. It's just so big, like I can't describe it. Isn't that enough? Can't you just believe me when I say that you mean everything to me? Everything. Nyssa frowns. Because what Chandra is saying doesn't match what Chandra is doing. Nyssa thought Chandra would know better. That the kind of love Nyssa needs is one that won't leave her. Or has she once again been drawn into Chandra's inextricable orbit, only to be trapped in a one-sided love? Like her own personal immortal son? Please, Chandra begs. Can you at least tell me if something's wrong? Nyssa looks down at the charred husk of her metal bones. To Nyssa, her pain is so obvious. She doesn't have the strength left to describe it, let alone heal it. She couldn't tell Teferi, Karn, or Koth about it. And she still can't even tell Chandra. Nyssa shakes her head. Go, then. Find a Johnny, and I'll just wait here. Chandra cups her hand around Nyssa's cheek and gently turns her head until their eyes meet. She bites her lips, and her voice is low with consolation. I'll be back, she says. Zalfir's not a bad place, Nyssa. I think you'd like it if you tried. Nyssa Ravain is sick of trying. Turning to hide the tears welling in her eyes, she picks up her shovel. She does not watch Chandra planes walk away, but Nyssa can still smell the scent that she leaves behind, like the last wisps of smoke from a fireplace. Nyssa wakes the next morning, and the first thing she feels is Chandra's absence. Instinctively, she reaches out to the soul of this unfamiliar place for comfort, but Zalfir is silent. Perhaps the land also hurts because it misses its home. The sting of a second abandonment pierces her heart, and she even wonders whether Ashaya, the elemental world soul of her homeworld, would still recognize her call. Nissa's nickname, Shaya, meant world waker, not world breaker. She lies on her bedroll, counting every inhale and every exhale. It's been a long time since she truly meditated. She used to practice every day before she joined the Gatewatch, before she met Chandra. She should try again. But not here. Every voice, every sound, every vibration of life outside her tent reminds her how the distance has grown between her and her friends. Still, there's one who might understand. Nyssa takes her staff and climbs the forested hill that overlooks the village. Awkwardly, she lowers herself to the ground, sitting with her legs crossed beside the sprout that used to be Ren. She's growing fast, nurtured by the light of Zalfir's five newly inherited sons. Nyssa had only spoken once to the dryad, and there's no point in speaking to the seedling. Nevertheless, she feels a unique kinship with the only other planeswalker who bound herself to the invasion tree. Nyssa saw so many ugly things from her time as a Phyrexian, but one beautiful moment stands clear in her mind. When Ren knit her fragile body into the sinew of the invasion tree, Nyssa's bones were filled with haunting, beautiful music. It was more than a single tree song. It was a hymn sung by a chorus of planar voices, played on the strings of ley lines. Nyssa tries to remember that song now. She closes her eyes and slows her breath. She listens to her heartbeat, willing it to calm with each inhale and exhale. She reaches into herself, 
into the roots of her soul, and she listens. A song lies beyond the silence. Its low tone rumbles deep in Nissa's chest like her early days as an animist before Ashaya. She turns her heart toward it, but she hears something else. A quiet, tinny, ringing coalesces behind her ears. Never mind that. She focuses on the song, the planar magic. But when she does, the ringing grows. She calls louder and so does the noise. Her ears are itching, twitching, burning now. Still she tries again, her heart pounding. Her soul screams out to the whispered song, but her cry is muffled by dozens of new, alien voices she recognizes and despises. The Eldrazi, Boles, and finally the loudest, Vyrexia. The ringing explodes into skull-shattering static. Vivid lightning pain crackles in her muscles and up her spine. Colorful sparks explode in the dark of her vision. She screams for real. When Nyssa opens her eyes, she's lying flat on her back in the shade of a nearby acacia, and the silent truth stares back at her. Every being who touched her mind was now buried in her soul. She has spent so long connecting to the others that she has smothered her own connection to the multiverse. Whether or not those bonds were made of her own volition, the planes have rejected her. She rises unsteadily to her feet. As her vision sharpens, she sees a blue light hovering in the air, a glow pulsing to the beat of the leyline song. Its edges resembled ragged cloth, as if someone took a knife to the fabric of reality. Nyssa reaches towards it and quickly pulls her hand back as a bolt of electricity jumps to her fingers. With a thunderous boom, the light tears open. The force throws Nyssa to the ground. She scrambles to her knees just in time to dodge the massive creature that burst from the light. The beast is like nothing she's ever seen before. A predator larger than a bear with deadly claws that emit curling storm clouds. Golden fissures of lightning trace its muscular body, emitting sparks that threaten to ignite the dry grass. The ground cracks under its feet, and with a swing of its limbs, a nearby shrub goes flying. When it sees Nyssa, it bellows with rage. She can't let it near the village. Too many are still recovering from the wounds of war. They cannot handle a frenzied animal. Nyssa Ravane may not be a planeswalker, but she's the only person here right now. She rolls across the ground. With one smooth motion, she grabs her staff and charges it with magic. Its tip lights green and the desert grass bends to her will. It entwines with itself, becoming thick ropes to entangle the creature's legs. But on contact with its electric skin, the plant matter dries and crumbles to ash. Nyssa summons roots, branches. The enraged beast tears through them all the same leaving dust in its wake. Still, she bought herself an opening to get back to her feet. With one deep breath, she tries to recall what it felt like to be a hero, to stop letting this creature play her like a game piece and become the hand that moves it. She wraps her fingers around her staff, and its twisted wood comes to life. Green vines curl around her wrists as she draws the sword from its heart. She sends her magic down the blade, and its metal shines green. She steps nimbly forward, but the use of even a little magic has somehow winded her. The beast lunges. But this time Nyssa is ready. She vaults upwards onto its back. When it rears, she has to dig her grip into its fur just to hold on. Burning heat pierces her glove. And she knows she won't have long. She doesn't want to hurt the creature, but she needs to immobilize it. She drives her sword into one of its lightning cracks on its flank. Not too far, just a prick for something so large. Green magic unwinds from the blade, solidifying into thick, spiked vines that pierce the creature's leg and wrap around its body. The beast bucks wildly before dropping to its damaged knee. The movement throws Nyssa into the air and she has barely enough time to tuck into a roll before hitting the ground. She's... She rights herself and looks at the animal. Her weapon is still wedged in its side. She watches the vines connected to it burn away. 
The creature shakes and rises, unscathed and even angrier. Its eyes meet hers as her sword falls out, useless, onto the ground. Nyssa presses her hands to the earth, calling to the ley lines for help as she used to. The ground glows under her touch as she asks, pleads, begs for an elemental to appear. The pebbles around her tremble and hope rises in her chest. Then they fall right back down. Zalfir cannot hear her. The creature charges directly into her, catching her on its broad claws. With a shake of its massive arms, it tosses her forward and she lands yards away with a sickening crunch. Pain explodes through her entire body. Through bleary vision, she lifts her chin and sees the beast readying to charge, claws extended to gore her and lightning crackling down its spine. Perhaps this creature is no ordinary animal. She thinks back to how it appeared when she tried to reach the ley lines. Maybe this is an elemental she summoned. One sent by Zalfir to avenge the wrong she had committed in the name of Phyrexia. She does not want to die. But she cannot deny her crimes deserve it. She lets her head drop fully to the ground. After all, why fight the world when you know who will win? The creature lunges forward, fangs bared, Nyssa braces for the blow, when suddenly the beast stops. It hangs suspended in time, gnarled claw ready to strike. Nyssa feels strong, warm, hands lifting her out of danger, and Koss' voice tells her, We've got you. Don't hurt it, Nyssa tries to say, but she isn't sure anyone can hear her. She sees the fairy staff outstretched, his radiant blue spell holding the beast in place. Karn moves towards the creature and wraps his massive metal arms around the creature's neck. I'm going to let go now, to fairy states. Karn nods. Ready. Time resumes. The beast finishes its swing, but its claws strike only air where Nyssa used to be. It wrestles against Karn, but its claws rake uselessly against steel. It gnashes its fangs, but Karn tightens his chokehold so it can't turn its neck. Then, the air grows hot with the smell of ozone, and white lightning bursts from the creature's skin. The explosion throws all four to the ground, and Nyssa lifts her head just in time to see the creature barrel into the distance, storm clouds trailing behind it. Koth is back on his feet, sliding an arm under Nyssa to help her up. He returns her weapon, now back in its staff form. Are you hurt? I'm fine. Nyssa struggles out of his grip. She takes the staff, using it to stand despite the pain throbbing down her entire body. How did you find me? Teferi was going to visit Ren when he saw the strange light atop the hill and gathered us to investigate. Luckily, she's all right too, Koth says, gesturing toward the plant. It's one strange light, all right, she hears Teferi say. He stands in front of the place the beast emerged, where she had seen the hole in reality. Now the gap is a massive portal, tall enough for any of them to walk through, even Karn. The creature, she explains. I think it came out of there. The portal calls to Nyssa. Something on the other side hums with the energy of a ley line song. It's like a chorus of overlapping chaotic melodies from different planes, but through it all, she feels a familiar vibration. It's faint, but it sounds like Zendikar. Even if the plane cannot hear her, her heart instinctively fills with longing. She needs more than instinct. She needs to understand. So she dares to ask, Where do you think this leads? She wants it to lead to her home. Hard to say, Teferi muses. That beast definitely wasn't from Zalfir. Desire grips Nissa's chest even harder. Could it have traveled from another plane? Karn appeared to shrug, an awkward gesture with his massive shoulders. It's possible. Realmbreaker burrowed holes through the fabric of reality. The Silex exploded in the blind eternities. Who knows what that might have changed? Nissa's throat tightens as she speaks. Do you think one of us should go through? Silence passes over the group, and Nyssa begins to worry. 
They could merely be thinking, or there could be something they aren't telling her. Finally, Karn shakes his head. The risks there are incalculable. If it indeed led to the blind eternities, without a spark you could be instantly destroyed. But that creature wasn't destroyed, Nissa shakes her head. Every frail strand of hope that she has built frays and snaps. Again, this is what it means to not be a planeswalker. Teferi places a reassuring hand on Nissa's shoulder. Or it's possible that creature is a planeswalker. But that's only one of an infinite number of possibilities. We don't know where this portal leads, so we can't say for sure what will happen. But to step through? Well, that would simply be a leap of faith. A leap of faith. Nissa is not the type of person who takes leaps of faith. Chandra, though. Chandra is a person who could do it, without even thinking. Koth speaks, interrupting her analysis. I feel the need to remind everyone that the creature is still out there and it's lost and angry. Our people have suffered greatly and we have a duty to protect our new home from further risks. He nods at Nyssa. Let's corral this creature and then we can talk about exploring. The group agrees and as much as Nyssa loathes to abandon the portal, she knows Koth is right. As much as the war took from her, others have lost even more. They need to help first. Teferi, Koth, and Karn have already begun to walk down the hill. Nyssa follows as quickly as her tired legs and aching ribs can, but before joining them she takes one last look at the glowing portal behind her. Nyssa still hurts. She lies on the bedroll in her tent, reaching for sleep that will not come. The civic healer had looked exhausted, but she still took the time to look Nyssa over. Nothing seemed broken. Nothing physical, anyway. Even so, she still made Nyssa stay behind when Teferi, Karn, and Koth went out to find the Lightning Beast. In some ways, Nyssa is glad for the rest because it means she can be alone. She hears muffled voices outside, going about their daily tasks, gossiping about people she has never met. She rolls over and attempts to sleep again. Times like these make her wish elven hearing wasn't so sensitive. But then the voices quicken, grow louder, and her calm is shattered by a scream, followed by the sound of thunder. Electricity heats the air, making her hair stand on end. Nyssa has no doubt the creature from the portal is here. Dread sinks into her stomach. What if it's looking for her? What if it followed her here to complete its mission? Her actions have left the village unguarded and in danger. She staggers upright, grabbing her staff as she exits the tent. Still not a planeswalker, she thinks. Once again, just the only person around. The creature is busy ransacking the mess tent. The ground is littered with torn canvas and spilled pots of stew. Even the largest wooden tables would have cracked in half, reduced to splinters. A brave team of Zalfirin and Mirin warriors have surrounded it, but she can see their weapons are still in desperate need of repair from the fight with the Phyrexians. She needs to help them lead it away from the village. With the help of her staff, she casts her magic forward. Thick roots emerge from the ground. They loop around the beast's neck and limbs, trying to tie it down or at least pull it in another direction. The effort causes Nissa's legs to shake, but she still wills herself to stay standing. She won't have much time until it burns the restraints away, but she takes advantage of its confusion. There... She runs towards a thick boabab tree just outside the village. Over here, she growls, unleashing another barrage of angry vines. The creature takes the bait. It turns away from the villagers' swords and spears, mere nuisances compared to this prickly new attacker. It swings at the plant's claws, cutting them down like a scythe. A few feet away, Nyssa raises another onslaught. The beast lunges forward again to chase its quarry. Slowly, vine by vine, swing by swing, Nyssa leads the creature out of the village. She breathes a sigh of relief to see the wounded inhabitants hurrying to safety. She's done one good thing at least. But the effort has exhausted her, the green light in her staff fizzles, and she collapses to her knees. And the creature has only one target now. Nyssa. It looms above her, claws ready to strike her down. 
It's so damn big up close. Nissa raises her staff in defense and braces for impact. Again, it doesn't come. A lone, burning figure stands in the way. Chandra. Internally, Nissa curses the knack for planeswalkers to show up exactly where there's trouble. Chandra has thrown up a barrier of fire between them and the creature. The beast staggers back and forth, trying to reach the prey it cornered just a second ago. Now she's hurling fireball after fireball at the animal, which is growing more and more agitated. It shakes the static sparks off its fur. She instructs Nissa, I'll take it from here, head back to the village. But Nissa was the one who summoned the creature. It followed her here, not Chandra. This is Nissa's fight, and Chandra can't even let her have that. Her staff blazes with green light. Hundreds of thorny vines thrust from the ground. One almost hits Chandra in the face. Hey, watch it, the pyromancer shouts. The vines whip at the beast. It roars against each stinging strike. One of them catches a fireball and ignites. The beast whines slightly. Moving away from the flame lash, Nissa watches Chandra crank up the heat. She grits her teeth as she watches every vine she conquered disintegrate in a blast of flame. It was as if she hadn't done anything at all. Sweat forms on her brow as she searches the landscape for her next move. Her eyes pass over the baobab. The baobab. Their thick trunks resist fire, and the massive tree would be a staunch ally if she could animate it. She reached her magic towards it, coaxes each branch to life, but she's not summoning an elemental that walks on its own accord. She must concentrate with all of her effort, will it to move, puppet every action. Her breathing is labored, her trembling palms sweaty under her gloves. Stem by stem, root by root, she forces it out of the ground. She gives it one final push, launching it at the beast. It hits the creature in the side, bowling it over into the grass. Tired as she is, Nissa still relishes the fleeting feeling of victory. Because Chandra takes this as her cue. Thanks, she grins. She burns even hotter. Too hot. She encloses the beast and the tree in a ring of flames as tall as an elephant. Nissa smells smoke, and she realizes the dry grass is starting to kindle. Chandra, stop! The pyromancer doesn't seem to hear her, or doesn't seem to care. She tightens her circle, closing in on the creature. It paces the edge, panicked as the flames close inward. It rears up, claws and teeth thrashing, and smashes the baobab to pieces. The water inside the tree evaporates, immediately on contact with Chandra's superheated flame, turning into white steam. Neither Nissa nor Chandra could have predicted the creature's next move. It inhales. With one deep breath, the storm beast sucks the hot steam from the sky. The added moisture makes it double in size, more than double. Now Colossus, it bats away any shards of broken tree like playthings. The burning debris sets the grass ablaze wherever it lands. It towers over the women. They run, but every step the creature takes equals 20 of theirs. Soon they find themselves directly under its massive form. It readies an attack. Watch out, Chandra pushes Nissa out of the way of its snapping jaws, sending them both tumbling into the hole left by the uprooted baobab. When the dizziness of the fall fades, Nissa looks up. The beast is scratching, gnashing at the opening, but the gap is too narrow for its huge form. They're safe, but for how long? Ah! Chandra's lit hair flares with frustration. She points her hands up toward the creature, another blast charging in her open palm. The beast has trapped them. The entire savanna is going to burn. Stop! Frustration and loneliness fill Nissa's lungs, emerging in a howl. Just let me save myself for once. The light fizzles in Chandra's hand. What? Nissa's heart is trembling, but this time not from exhaustion. She uses all the energy she has left to turn her thoughts, her regrets, her worries into words. You made me a promise, Chandra, and you still left. Do you think, she says, voice cracking, that because I no longer have a spark that I'm happy to see you running around the multiverse like nothing has changed? That I'm happy just waiting for you to come back? The flames in Chandra's hair extinguish themselves returning to warm, natural red. 
Nissa chokes as she speaks. If that's how it's going to be, you don't need to return. I'll take care of myself. Chandra pauses, thinking about what to say, and lowers her head. Her voice is soft when she answers. No, I know you. Well, I, I knew you. I guess things have changed. And they're still changing. She raises her warm eyes to meet Nissa's. But I still want to know you. Chandra takes Nissa's hand in hers, and Nissa's heart leaps in her throat. Nissa, I am so, so, so sorry. Spark or not, you're an incredible fighter and even better person. And I'm so sorry to have ignored that. But Nissa's soul still aches. She isn't ready to forgive just yet. At that moment, fire and dirt begin to rain down on their heads. Unable to reach them, the lightning beast has decided to smother them instead. Perhaps we can stop it if we work together, Nissa says. Chandra nods. All right, what's the plan? Warmth swells in Nissa's chest to finally be asked. But without her strongest magic, she can only respond, I don't know. Is there anything we've done before? Nissa thinks back. Every time before, the elemental magic had come so effortlessly. She now knows that she was taking it for granted and she bats away a hail of dirt from above. There's got to be something, Chandra urges. What about when we channeled my pyromancy through Zendikar's ley lines? If it beat an Eldrazi, it'll work here, right? But Nissa, Nissa's admission comes in as a whisper. I can't reach the ley lines anymore. What? Nissa shakes her head, coughing from the dust cloud forming around them. They just won't listen to me. I tried many times, but when I call out to them, it's like my voice isn't my own. Like it belongs to Phyrexia instead. Like everything I've ever connected to is drowning me out. For once, Chandra pauses. You know, she concludes, you have good connections too. What do you mean? It's true. You did bad things when they had you, but everyone you've connected with over the years with the Gatewatch, we're just happy you're still here with us. Chandra sets fire to a chunk of moist dirt that was about to fall on Nyssa, turning it into a soft rain of ash. With me. For the first time since she awoke in Zalfir, Nyssa smiles. Chandra, sweet Chandra, even if she doesn't realize it, has always understood and explained emotions better than Nyssa ever could. Chandra continues, Your connections aren't drowning out your voice, Nyssa. They're changing it to something new. Maybe something even more powerful. Infinite voices. Infinite possibilities, right? Infinite possibilities, Nyssa offers her hand to Chandra. All right, let's try. Gripping Chandra's fingers in hers, Nyssa closes her eyes. She retreats inwards and listens for her inner voice. It's hard, much harder than before. But Chandra is dutiful, helping her concentrate, blasting the falling rocks away before they can reach her. Nyssa is greeted by a ringing deep in her ears, but she refuses to be deterred. With her connections in mind, she picks the static apart into unique melodies, the individual songs she picked up from all around the multiverse. She arranges them, harmonizes them, and this time, when she calls to Zalfir, her voice is amplified in chorus. She offers an apology. The plane answers, it too was cut off from everything it knew, from the connections it had made. It too was scarred by Phyrexia and is growing into something new. It forgives her and Nyssa can finally forgive herself. Magic floods her flesh, her blood, her bone. She can hear Chandra laugh, delighted by their success. Nyssa uses the elemental power to reach out to the creature. It's an elemental, but one made of unknown power, which neither Nyssa nor Zalfia recognize. But Nyssa can sense its disorientation and confusion. Trapped in an earthly form by Zalfir's unfamiliar magic and trying desperately to return to the pure energy that created it. Kind of like Nyssa. The answer dawns on her. Steam, Nyssa announces. Huh? 
It's a storm elemental, a creature made of magic, but it's from another plane, so it's struggling to tap into Zalfir's power. I think we can give it the energy it needs if we heat it up. Chandra winks, heat? Now that I can do. Nissa lets Zalfir in and directs its power into Chandra. Her vision becomes a blinding, shimmering green. But even if she cannot see, she feels Chandra's hand in hers. It grows warm, warmer, until it is unbearably hot. But she does not let go. By her magic, like a miniature sun, coalesces in Chandra's free hand, so bright that Nissa can see it through the green. With their connection made whole, Nissa sees what Chandra sees, feels what Chandra feels. Chandra aims upward, and a solid column of fire catches the lightning creature in the face. Together, they watch the beast inhale. Chandra pours heat and energy into the creature. Its molecules and magic begin to vibrate faster and faster. Its fur melts into vapor. The lightning seams on its body crack and expand, and the beast breaks into pieces that convulse so furiously they liquefy and then evaporate. Jets of steam escape its fading form and rise into the air, coalescing into a rumbling thunder overhead. Nyssa wants to believe the cloud is grateful with laughter. She laughs, and when the green light fades from Nyssa's eyes, she sees Chandra, hair ablaze and laughing too. Rain falls in the desert. One by one, fat droplets from the sky coalesce together into a torrent. A torrent becomes a flood. Water fills the crevasse they are trapped in, buoying them up. Soon they are floating together, watching the cloud move away to reveal a clear night sky. Chandra, hair still on fire, looks every bit like a lantern on the water. She watches Nyssa, refusing to take her warm eyes off the elf for one second. Love comes in a lot of forms. I loved Gideon. I loved Jaya. You asked me what kind of love I have for you? I didn't know how to say it. Nyssa's heart beats faster. Then what would you say now? Instinctively, Chandra tries to move her hand while she talks creating awkward splashes around her. It's still hard to describe. When I saw you there in New Phyrexia, I realized I wanted to save you more than I wanted to save the world. My love for you, it's like when you left Gatewatch, came back to the Gatewatch. It's not perfect all the time, but I want to do my best. I don't understand. How can love change? To Nyssa, it seemed like such a straightforward emotion, the same primal, immutable quality as magic. Chandra looks away to hide her face, but Nyssa can tell her cheeks are as hot as her flame. Sometimes you convince yourself it's better to do what's easy, assumed, natural, because it's easier than facing the unknown. Under stress, you become who people expect. Throw a giant fireball instead of thinking first. You know? But you saw past that. Always. You made me better. Emboldened by Chandra's vulnerability, Nyssa musters her own honesty. But you hurt me. I don't want to be left alone again. And I'm sorry. More sorry about that than anything I've ever done in my entire stupid life, Chandra turns to face her again, eyes bright with a new promise. When I went to find a Johnny, I realized he doesn't want to be found. He'll come back when he's ready. I'm still frustrated, of course, but I have to give him time and space. That's when I realized I can't just burn through any relationship I care about. Love leaves room for the other person to be who they are. I have to make room for you too. I want to. Like fire needs oxygen. Nissa asks her final question. You have room for someone who can't planeswalk? Yes, I'll make it. I will falter, I will be tempted, but I will make it. Fire is going to burn, no matter what you do. But you can shape it if you try. And I want to try, for you. Nissa thinks for a moment. Finally, she nods. I can handle that. She leans over and places her hand on Chandra's neck, pulling the pyromancer towards her. 
Their eyes meet one last time before closing, and Nyssa pulls Chandra into a kiss. The sudden storm had caused a flash flood that stranded Teferi, Karn, and Koth in a cave a few miles outside of town. They were unable to return until the next morning after the waters receded. Nyssa, Chandra, and the villagers welcomed them back with blankets, warm stew, and smiles. Later that night, the friends celebrated the woman's clever victory. This time, Nyssa joins in. She and Chandra split the sweetest mango she'd ever tasted. When the last bonfire dies down, Nyssa takes Chandra's hands in hers and leads her up the hill overlooking the village. She waves at Ren before stopping in front of the portal. Here it is, she gestured. The place where that creature came from. Together they gaze into the swirling blue light. Chandra asks, where does it go? I don't know, Nyssa admits. Neither did Teferi, Koth, or Karn, for that matter. But when I listen, really listen, I think I can still hear Zendikar out there. Strange and distorted, but possibly still out there. I could just be imagining it completely, but I think I would risk that unknown to see home again. Chandra nods firmly, and I'll be walking right alongside you. Every planeswalker can go anywhere they want, but Nyssa recognizes Chandra's need to roam runs deeper than that. It's part of who she is, and part of what Nyssa loves. So Nyssa offers, maybe after that I wouldn't mind seeing more, as long as it's with you. Chandra breaks into a wide smile. Let me be your torch then. First stop, find your way home. Hey, we can even check in on that little forest you started a while ago. They move towards the portal and each place one foot on the threshold. Nyssa wavers and turns to Chandra, just in case she asks, Are you sure you want to commit to a leap of faith? Together? You bet. Hand in hand, Chandra and Nyssa step through the portal into just one of infinite possibilities. March of the Machine, the Aftermath, She Who Breaks the World. Written by Grace P. Fong. Narrated by Wyatt Fawcett. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the March of the Machine Aftermath story. Um, it seems that Wizards of the Coast has started to do their own versions of these full narrated ver uh, episodes of these stories. And I ran a little poll on social media and most people asked for me to continue doing my own version. So I'm going to continue this for as long as I can. And, and hopefully we can continue to have fun and, and introduce some new people to the magic story and, and please obviously let me know if uh, there's anything I can do to improve the experience of these, um, putting them on Spotify uh, slowly. So that is another bonus so far. I haven't heard whether or not the Watsi ones are any good. I'm going to take a listen to them in the in the coming days and see if there's anything i need to to adjust or 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 make room for but uh i love you guys so much thank you again for letting me do these and for taking part and commenting and liking the march of the machine episodes got so many views and so much traction it really warms my heart and and i appreciate all the the kindness that has been shared on social media please feel free to say hello to me anytime so we could talk magic, we could talk story, we could talk whatever you'd like. If you just want to get something off your chest, I'm always here to listen as well. Um, yeah, if you haven't yet, I would love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're trying to get those subscription numbers up so that we have access to more tools here on, on YouTube. And yeah, check the link in the description of this video if you're listening to this on YouTube. And you'll find links to the Spotify store, our merch store. Uh, and some affiliate links. Anything that you do can support the channel. Share these. Share them with your friends, family. Share them on social. Uh, pick up some really cool magic shirts. Subscribe to our show on Spotify. Again, I can't 
tell you how much I appreciate this enough. Thank you so much, and I'll see you on the next plane. I love you. Bye. <laughs>